Isn't it nice? Looking at you awkwardly, you make me uncomfortable. It's so good to see everybody. Uh, I'm going to open in prayer, and then we're going to sing. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and I pray you that the, the type of weather this morning can, I know for me, I'm just kind of mellow and calm, and, um, and I thank you, Lord God, that you would give us peace, and you would remind us that uh, um, your presence is uh, sometimes dramatic, and sometimes ecstatic, sometimes quiet sometimes mellow, that your spirit speaks to our spirit, just as we need. So I pray this morning we would engage with you. We would see you for who you are. And Father, for those of us who are coming in this morning with heavy hearts, I pray, Lord, you would put your hand underneath it to lift it. For those of us who might be coming in with pain and brokenness, Father, I pray for comfort and healing. For some of us who come in elated and overjoyed, I pray, Lord God, that we would be contagious. But I pray that all of us, Lord God, would give you our very best this morning and engage with you, heart, mind, and soul. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Kingdoms and kings will fall You'll stand above them all Forever, amen Nations will be no more Dominion will be yours Forever, amen Forever Forever, amen Seated on the throne
exalted. I had my eyes and I tremble before him. I tremble before him.
and hearts be open to see your greatness. Even in the midst of circumstances that we may not consider to be great. May your glory just penetrate that. May your character be exemplified. May your righteousness go forward. May your kingdom may your kingdom bear fruit. Thank you Jesus for just being you and thank you for the body. Thank you that we can gather together this morning, brothers and sisters, with your DNA flowing through each one of us, created to be in your likeness, both in our being born, but also in our being born again. So, Father, this morning be honored, be glorified, be magnified. And may we be blessed, not because you give us blessings, but because we've come into your presence. We've experienced your grace, your mercy, your love, your heartbeat. And if nothing else, let that be sufficient. That we have experienced you, my God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a kid, you need to go to the front and get out. Go to class. If you're, if you're not a kid, you need to act like one. Meet somebody. Take a minute and say hello and greet somebody. everybody. Welcome to Mosaic. My name is Heather. It is wonderful to have you here. If you are a guest with us, there is a white pamphlet in the back of your pew, and it's titled Things You Might Want to Know. Go ahead and take a look at that. You can also visit our website at mosaicmansfield.com. Uh, also in the back of your pew, there's a gray connection card, and that's your tool to communicate with us. So if you have a question or need information on serving, fill out that connection card, and once you complete it, drop it in one of our giving boxes. They're located out here in the narthex and out each one of these doorways into the main hall. <laughs> All right, so this week, uh, we, our third Wednesday breakfast is going to be coming up very soon, so it would be great to have your help to restock our pantry to get ready for that. So if you could uh, remember uh, to grab one extra item this week while you're out, that would be great. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so. You can drop that off here uh, the weekend. There is a grocery cart downstairs that you can put it in, or you can bring it during our office hours, Tuesday through Thursday. I have no idea what time it is. Open on Tuesday through Thursday. 
the office hours. What are you asking me? What are the office hours? Nine to three, or nine to four, actually, on Tuesday. Nine to four, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I thought there you were asking you what time it. it was now. It's because <laughs> you were listening. Uh, oh, golly. Maybe if you hadn't been so preoccupied. Oh, let's get through this. Okay, Mitch McVicker, there's a free concert on August 22nd at 7 p.m. He toured with Rich Mullins. We I did. Have I was touring with Rich Mullins one time. We were in Erie, Pennsylvania. It was like midnight. Mitch McVicker toured oh, okay, with Rich Mullins bad. to clear any of that up. And he is touring now, and we are so glad that he's going to be joining us here at Mosaic on August 22nd. So join us for that. <laughs> wow, it's a wild morning. Thanks for being here and putting up with us. Oh, is it my turn now? It is. You for just real. keep going for a second if you would. Hi. Okay. This is so much fun. All right. We could really <laughs> go in several directions. You're doing great. Yeah, thank and you. And you're a lot prettier than I'm I am. I'm smiling. So. All right. <laughs> isn't her smile great? No, no, isn't her smile great? Give her a hand. Here's the deal. I'm going to embarrass her for a minute if I may. She's re she, you can leave the room squared if you want. I'm going to embarrass you regardless. Okay, so here. Uh, you know, the, the prayer we started to pray, or some of, you know, we at least introduced, you know, four weeks ago, uh, to some degree is exemplified by that smile. And those are eyes that invite. You just, it just, you glow, just. So, okay, here we go. Ready? Ha! Well, this last Wednesday, one of the things that Heather didn't get a chance to talk about was this last Wednesday evening, we had our first, first Wednesday of the month prayer time together uh, corporately. We had, a, we had a great time. It was just a great time. We spent some time in this room, about, golly, I think between 50 or six of us showed up, and we spent the first 20 or 30 minutes in here just worshiping and, and you know, different types of corporate prayer. And then I had stations downstairs, five different things that we needed to pray for that God commands us to pray for. And so we went downstairs and we all took turns at, well, what time allotted, we took turns at different stations and prayed for the things that uh, we believe God calls us to pray for. And it was a fantastic time. If that's something that piques your interest, we'll be doing that again the first Wednesday in September. I would encourage you to be part of that. Very exciting time. <sighs> okay, all right. So, I'm going to tell you this morning, get your Bible out. We're just going to dig, okay? So, what we've been doing is we've been talking about, you know, over the last couple months, we've been talking about love. We've been talking about love. We've been talking about wise love. Then we talked about the fact that wise love is kind. And then we talked about the fact that kind, wise love gives. And kind, wise love gives wisely. And then that took us into this idea of gleaning, this biblical principle where God says, don't glean your fields, don't glean them. What he means is don't strip them bare. And the reason he says that is because what he wants us to do is live in perpetual faith. He wants us to live in perpetual trust. He wants us to recognize that everything that we have is his, and he has given it to us. In fact, when the command is given in the Old Testament, it says, he says that remember you were slaves. Remember that you were in slavery. And I have I rescued you. I set you free. I have provided for you everything you have. And now you trust me. You trust me. And how I want you to trust me is this. I want you to be responsible and diligent and work hard in regard to cultivating your fields. And then this is what I'd like you to do. In, in, in response to what I have done for you, I don't want you to strip your fields bare. The first thing that does is it forces us to trust God because our inclination is to grab everything that we can and make sure that we have it in storage because we're going to need this. And so our tendency is to, you know, pick every peach off the tree and pick every berry off the bush and pick, you know, pull every onion out of the ground. That's an odd combination, but I love onions. You ever get the urge to just bite into an onion? I do. I, every once in a while, I look at an onion and my mouth starts to water, and uh, you know, Kroger gets really mad because I leave like four or five behind. <laughs> I was told, that actually, if you crave onion, you're probably low on magnesium. So there you go. If you ever have this urge to just bite into an onion like an apple, magnesium. I'm just saying. Okay, so, you know, the whole idea in all of this is this, is that we don't strip our fields bare. And the reason we don't strip our fields bare is twofold. And the first is that God has provided this for me. The second is that he will continue to provide. 
And it's an act of trust. It's an act of faith. It's an act of obedience. Now, the outcome, the fruit of that obedience is that others get to glean. The fruit of the obedience is that those who are still out in the desert, those who are still wandering, those who are outside the fields, those who have not get to pick from what it is that God has blessed you with. So this whole idea is that God would be honored and glorified by his children, that we would trust him and not thinking that we need to pick everything bare, that we would perpetually trust him and have faith in him in regard to what he's already provided and that he will provide again. The next is that we get to demonstrate his generosity, that not only do we not pick, pick our fields bare, but we leave it for others to be able to come in and pick. This is a fantastic thing. Because it's not merely that we're now helping the poor. They're the beneficiaries of, of God's blessing in this regard. What they're actually experiencing is God's provision. The idea is that this fruit would actually point toward the center, which is the heartbeat of God. And that that would be resonating, that would be pounding through us. Boom, boom. You know, Aaron went thump, 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 thump. I think it was in the 1050 service last week. And, he, and as he was teaching, he had this thump, thump. It just, the rhythm and that rhythm begins to echo in us when we trust him and obey him and walk as he walked. And God is perpetually generous and calls us to do the same. So what happens is these people on the outskirts, these foreigners, these people who are traveling through, orphans, widows, those who are down on their luck, are able first and foremost to pick away at these outside, at these outside rows. Well, what is it with the outside rows? And we talked a little bit about what, how a field is cultivated, right? And the outside rows tend to not produce like the inside, the heart of the field does. And the reason is it's, it's exposed to weather. It, the, the, usually the water will run off, and so they're not usually watered quite as well. Pollination is only about half what it's going to be because it's, it's still exposed to the outside, and it's not surrounded by their crops. It's most susceptible to disease, to disease, and so it won't quite bear what the inner field will bear. And so what God says is, listen, do me a favor, my, the heart of the harvest, the reward to the worker is in the center. You leave these alone. Don't even pick from these. That way the person who goes by is able to then pick from these outer rows and these outer bushes and trees. And What principle is that? Remember, everything we experience on earth that God has provided for us and then commands is an expression of a kingdom truth. Do you know what this one is? And everyone read in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good? Just taste and see. That's what we let happen when we leave our outer margins open to people picking from them. Taste and see that God is good. Taste and see. You know, as a, it, before I became a believer, the, the one thing I understood, um, you know, just in terms of wanting to try God out, was that he didn't mind if I tested his commands. The word says taste and see, and so that's what I did. I read his commands, and I obeyed them. And it blew me away that what he said happened. I was like, crazy. And once that began to happen, and I began to taste the fruit of God, I wanted to get closer to his heart. So you know what God also says about the heart of the harvest in regard to our trust and our faith and our knowing that he'll provide, and then our diligence in making sure that we're cultivating the field in such a way as to produce the best harvest we can? That's a hint for what's to come is that those who have now experienced and tasted and see that God is good, what he also says is, not only do I want you to leave these and don't even pick from them, I don't want you to strip this bear. And the reason is, is because once little Johnny Shortcake comes in and tastes me, I want him now to have the courage to come in to the center of the field and taste the ripeness of me. Isn't that a fantastic, fantastic thing? Now that they've tasted to see that God is good, they come back and they want to search out the heart of God. And we get to be the demonstration of that. We get to be the carriers of that. We get to be God's hands and feet. Isn't that an awesome principle? So go to your notes real quick, if you would. I'm going to read this first paragraph with you. It says, do not be afraid. Now, this is on the type side, not the hand-hewn, drawn, stick person side. You ready? All right, it says, do not be afraid, do not hold tight. Now, this is the idea. We're, we've talked about a calibrated heart, and, and we didn't get to finish one of the passages, and so we're going to get into a lot of Scripture today. You're going to need your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, grab one from the pew in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, keep that one. We'd love for you to have it. If there's another Bible to do you better, we'll let us know, and we'll do our best to accommodate you. That was my Bible commercial. Okay, so here we go. 
It says, a calibrated heart, pick a box, any box, resources. It says, do not be afraid, do not hold tight, do not strip bare. That's the, that's the idea of do not glean. But give as it has been given. That's the idea of recognizing who owns what. Meet the poor as you have been met. That's the remembrance of our having been slaves to sin and in our poverty. Live in perpetual trust, and the one who provides life, and the one who, uh, uh, the, that the one that the, who provides life will provide everything you need to live that life. That's the idea of trust. The God who gave us eternal life will also give us what we need to live that life out. Now stop for a minute. Think about that principle for one moment. If for whatever reason God chose to give me eternal life and continues to leave me on this earth day after day, because I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but I have today, the fact of the matter is, is I can trust that if you give me inter- eternal life, he's going to give me what I need to live out today. And living out today is not merely for my enjoyment, neither is it even you know, on the other side for my survival, but it's that I may live today in perpetual faith and trust in such a way as to walk that others might glean from me. That's the call. Because my living that way is the expression of God among us. Wow! Think about that. Okay, so here we go. (sighs) So, where was I? Anybody remember? I think my glasses are bent. Where where was I? Help me out. Come on. It's Sunday. Live in such a way. Oh, thank you. And to live in such a way as to reflect him, God. And that trust, that faith, that joyful peace that surpasses all understanding and guards our hearts and minds, because that's how we fight anxiety, and anxiety is when we don't trust God, right? That demonstration of God's character, his heartbeat, will reveal Jesus, will reveal Jesus to anyone who's watching. This is why we're still on earth. This is why we've been saved and left here. This is why God gives us what he gives us and asks us to live the way he asks us to live. This is why he says don't strip your fields bare because he wants Jesus to be revealed in us and through us to a dying world. So we go on. So the demonstration of God's character's heartbeat will reveal Jesus to anyone who's watching, and believe me, people watch. And thus doing exactly what God himself had intended, that his people living according to the faith that they have been given, trusting the Father, having received life and all that they need to live that life, and now giving as he gives shows the lost world. It shows the lost world, the poor and the enslaved, that God is God. That God is God. That he loves his creation and that he has given his son and still gives life. Love, wi- love, wise love, why love li- wise love being kind, it gives and it gives wisely. So now we want to create this life of giving. So here we go. We're going to do a quick review of a couple different things. Turn to Mark chapter 10, if you would, please. Turn to Mark chapter 10. This is the second gospel of the New Testament. Okay, so you have Matthew and then Mark. So if you got to Malachi or Matthew, you haven't gone far enough. If you went to Mark, Matthew, Mark, Mark if you went to Luke or John, you went too far. Okay, and we're in chapter 10, and we're going to start at verse 17. And I'm reading papyrus today myself. This is my favorite. Don't you love just reading the papyrus as opposed to like off the digital? This is actually like paper. Ooh. All right, here we go. I'm going to pray before we read. Father, thank you for your word. Just blow us away today. Help us to see you and to be moved by you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're doing is looking at the rich young ruler with all that he needed and more, okay? So what we're doing is we're looking how heart gets calibrated and what the issue is here. So in your notes it says um, he had more than he needed. He did not see it for what it was, that it was God's. Though he might have had all the righteous things in his heart, you know, that he had done, his heart was far from the Father's, and he could not hear or sense or feel what it is that Jesus was actually saying to him. So let's take a look at this. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. He said, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud. Um, Honor your father and mother. And teacher, he says, I have kept these things since a boy. And so what he's saying is I have lived righteously and I've done everything you've commanded. And for whatever reason, something is still missing. How do I know that? Well, because he ran up to him and fell on his knees and asked him, what must I do? What more must I do to enter the... So here he is. He's performing everything he can religiously. He's, he's living as righteously as possibly can. He thinks he's experienced the blessings of God because he has much. We have to remember culturally in the ancient days, especially among the Jews, it was evidence of God's favor was that you had a lot. 
Jesus came to reverse that, to flip the economy upside down. So here's a man who had a lot and who lived righteously. He was a teacher of the law and a leader among the people. He had done this at an early age. It says it was a young man, a young leader. So this man was advancing. And he falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, what else must I do? There's something missing. Look what it says. Jesus replies, he says, Jesus looked at him and did what? Loved him, had compassion on him. He was moved by by this occasion. He says, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, we have to be careful here, because if, 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 if the rich young ruler takes this in the wrong way, he just sees this as one more act, one more righteous deed, one more command to follow to somehow prove to God that he was okay and make it into the kingdom. That wasn't Jesus' point. Jesus' point was, listen, you have all these things, you've done all this righteousness, you have this sense of having been under God's favor because of the life that you've lived, and I'm telling you, your heartbeat isn't beating with God's. And in fact, what you've done is you've placed your security and your worth and your purpose and your significance in everything that you have. You have placed your security and your eternal eternal welfare in what it is you possess. And you think you own these things. And I'm saying to you, in order for you to be released from this, you must release yourself from the idol you have created. You must release yourself from the, the the thing that you've placed your affection on. You must release yourself. Because the the command isn't that we all sell everything we have and give it to the poor. That is not a general command given to all men. This was specific to this young man because of the heartbeat that he held tight to all he had and how he saw what he had and the recognition that even though he he thought he was favored by God and he had acted righteously and, and, and religiously and he was a ruler and a teacher at a young age that he had missed the heartbeat of God. And so what he's saying is, Jesus is saying to him, and he would have known this principle inside out, let the people glean from you. Look what happened. Jesus looked at him and loved him, says one thing you lack. Verse 22, at this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed, and the reason they were amazed is because they understood the cultural context, the cultural significance of this. They also had been taught that God's favor is among those who have received much and have lived righteously and rule the people and teach. And they're stunned. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. The disciples were even more amazed. They were astonished and said to each other, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Calibrated heart. On what do we place our affections? Go to Luke chapter 2, if you would. Or 12, excuse me, Luke 12. We're going to see an extension of this man. How it is he sees his possessions and how it is he sees the great provider. We're in Luke 12, we're going to look at verse 13. Again, we're not going to sit very long on any of these passages. You ready? Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell tell my brother divided his inheritance with me. I love Jesus' response. Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Why do you think this would matter to me? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Against all kinds of what? All kinds of what? Greed. Listen, what keeps us what, what causes us to strip our fields bare? Greed. What causes us to want to clench to what we have? Greed. Now, that greed can be just self-indulgent. That greed can be an act of fear. That greed can be an act of faithlessness or lack of trust. But regardless, when we see the command that God gives us to not strip those fields bare, and we just, we, you get, and we can't fight off the idea of, of keeping everything that we have and not letting anybody else touch it, Ugh. right? 
It's about greed, and this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, watch out. Be careful. He's saying, listen, he's saying, examine your heart. With whose heart are you being? Look what he goes on to say. He says, watch out, bend your guard against all kinds of greed, not just one kind of greed. A lot of times we think of greed and we think of somebody who, you know, a little kid who holds on to his toys, or we think of somebody who's miserly in regard to the money. But we're talking about all kinds of greed, which means he's talking about all occasions of life, and he's talking about every field of our lives. So look what it goes on to say. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life did not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, he's reminding everybody around him. He's undoing the economy we just talked about with the rich young ruler. You think that the expression of your success is by that much you have. You think at this time that God's favor is on you. In fact, I don't know that we don't think this now, by the way, that God's favor is on me when I get a lot. You think that. Stop there. Oh, oh, get, 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 get. Oh, stop there for a minute. How often do we think that God blessed me because I just got? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I can go any further today. I mean, I want us to think about that one for a minute. How often do we think that God blesses us because we got? We forget what the rest of the world's Christians are living under and through and with and without. Let alone. We're going to redefine blessing in a minute. Remind me to do that or else I'll forget. Okay, so here we go. Watch. So he goes on and he says, uh, so he says, all kinds of greed, it, it, your, your life does not consist in the abundance of the, the significance of your life, the success of your life, the definition of your life, does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. You're not blessed just because you got. In fact, I would say that sometimes when we get, it's the greatest test of our understanding of a blessing. We'll go there. And he told them this parable, the ground, the fields, the orchards, the vineyards, the groves of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops, which in and of itself is not necessarily a bad idea. If we were to go into Proverbs, it speaks of the fact that we are to cultivate our fields and we're to take the harvest and we're to use some and store some. So let's not throw wisdom out the window here, but let's keep going. Look what it says. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Um... Carrie, you're smart. What, what, when somebody uses I and my, what words are those? Are those adjectives? Are those, what are those? When we, when we identify ourselves by that, I, me, my? Pronouns, thank you. All right, I was a history major, not an English major, and my wife typed all my papers. Okay, so, <laughs> I was an A student, but I failed English 9 like, so, well, I don't know, four times. Okay, so here we go. And which is, I think, when they taught this thing they call grammar. But, okay, but I think you probably learned this in like third grade, but at that point I was ADD and my teachers were kicking me out of the room. <sighs> which is why I plan in my own church, because I keep getting kicked out of things. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. All right, so here we go. Ready? All right, so look what it says. It says, be on your guard against greed. Watch the pronouns. The ground of a certain rich man produced a crop, and he thought to whom? Himself. What shall what? I do. What's the next one? I have no place to store what? My crops. What's this an indicator of? Ownership. Last two weeks ago, we talked about the idea of shifting, as Americans in particular, shifting our mentality as believers from ownership to stewardship. This is really important. And this is really what God, Jesus is going to demonstrate right here. Because the idea of ownership is, is that this is mine. I have earned it. I have purchased it. I, I did anything I did. I own this. Stewardship says it's somebody else's. When I'm a steward, I'm an administer or an administrator of somebody else's stuff. Each one of us in this room basically is a minister. I love the fact that the root word to administrate is minister. And what's the idea of it? The idea of administration or to administer, to be a steward, listen, is to distribute, distribute the goods of the master accordingly and appropriately by the needs around you. See, God is the owner. He's given us the privilege of managing or being stewards or administrating what it is he has. And our role in the kingdom is to disperse, is to distribute the stuff of the king 
Isn't that fantastic? We circumvent that when we decide we own it, when we say this is mine, when we hold tight to it, when we strip our fields bare, we have said to God, this one's mine, thanks, I appreciate it. I know you've made me a steward, but I have chosen to own. This is a really important moment. It's an important moment for a couple reasons. And I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar here for a second. And if you take your notes home, there's all kinds of scripture to support this stuff. Please go home and read it. But this is what I want us to think in these terms. Two different times Paul says, I think in Corinthians and Philippians, he says not only does he, not t- does he talk about the fact or at least imply the idea that we don't own what we have, you know what else he says? We don't even own ourselves. I am not my own. Stop. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm a steward. I'm an administrator. Listen, I get to minister. Isn't that an awesome thought? That the owner, the king, the master, the one who possesses all these things has taken us under his wing and says, listen, I trust you so much by what I've done in you and for you and your response to me that I'm going to give you the privilege of administration. I'm going to give you the privilege of distribution. I'm going to give you the privilege of giving to those in need as they need. When I bless you, it's not merely to bless you, although I delight in blessing you and I want you to enjoy the blessing. But the greatest, enjo- the greatest enjoyment you will ever receive, the greatest satisfaction you will ever receive is not owning that which I give you, but administering it. Because at that moment, you become like me. You become like the Father. You become exactly what our dad was. One who owns and then distributes. One who has and then gives. And the moment we begin to give, we become just like our Father. We become children of God. Isn't that a fantastic, fantastic privilege we have? Well, if that's the privilege we have, then what we can't do is short-circuit it by grabbing a hold of everything and thinking we own anything, let alone our own lives. Because then he orchestrates the opportunities for us to be able to distribute where he would like it distributed. And that includes, listen, that includes me. Myself, it includes how I am distributed, how I am administered, how I am given. So, look what it says next. So it says, The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now this, is, this goes, strikes right at the heart of God's command to not strip your fields in, in every way possible. First, he doesn't see himself as a steward and administrator. He sees himself as the owner. He doesn't see God as a provider. He sees his work as being that which provided. He doesn't see the idea of living in perpetual faith. He's going to store this up for years. He doesn't even see the importance of work ethic and responsibility and cultivating those fields every year. I can, many years I can rest on my laurels. Does this sound familiar? Look what it goes on to say. This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods and things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I think even in that sense, we have to watch retirement. How do we perceive that as believers in Christ, as administers of the gospel, as distributors of the kingdom and the king's stuff? But God said to him, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for whom? For yourself. For yourself. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself and is not rich toward whom? Toward God. Because when we're rich toward others, we're rich toward God. Keep going. All right, here we go. All right, so... 
Um, uh Uh-oh, I lost my notes. There we go. All right. So now turn to James chapter 4. Man, I'm glad we have all morning. Got a lot to get through still. So if this is your first time here, we last about six hours. So, All right, James 4, 1. You ready? This is pretty obvious. I'm not going to have to mess with it too much. Look what it says. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Okay, James is in the back of the New Testament. If you got to Hebrews, you haven't gone far enough. That's the last big book. If you got to 1 Peter or 2 Peter, you went too far, back up. We're in chapter 4, verse 1. Ready? Awesome. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something and you don't get it. You'll kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. The quarrel, you quarrel and fight. Now look at this. You do not have because you do not ask who? God. You don't acknowledge God as God. You don't, give, you don't go to the provider. You don't see God as being the provider. The minute we don't ask God, what we're saying to God is, I don't need God. We're saying to God, I don't recognize you as God. Neither do I recognize you as the one who provides. We don't. I read an excellent article by a guy named Tim Keller. He was talking about prayer, and he said, listen, the moment you pray, you let God be God. And you're treating God as God, and now you have thought of God as God. The minute you pray, prayer is the one thing where when we begin to do it, we are saying to God, you're God, and here I am. And so James is saying, you don't have because you don't ask God. But then he says something else. Look what it says next. And this is where we have to be really careful, because this this is the calibration of the heart. Watch what it says now. He says... You do not have because you do not ask God, verse 3. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with what? With wrong motives. That you may do what? Spend what you get on your pleasures. In other words, you're, you're not asking to get to give. You're asking to get to get and to have. Mm. You're not asking to get to give. You're asking to get to get. And God is saying, listen, I want to answer your prayers, but here's the deal. You need to be like me. And what I have, I give. And everything you have is mine. And I've not given it to you to hoard or to hold on to or to think that you've made it now. Or your security lays in, lies in that. But in fact, I've given to you that you might imitate me and give away too. And so the first reason we don't have is because we don't make God God. We don't let him be God. And we don't treat him as God. So we don't ask. I'll get another job, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll da-da-da-da-da, right? The second reason we don't get is because we ask with wrong motives. And the motive is tested in regard to your generosity. Does your heart beat with God's? When you, when you cultivate the field and you develop, then the harvest begins to come. Are you leaving the outside rows for, for those who are wandering by and the foreigner and the widow? And are you leaving the heart of the harvest for those who can come in and now taste the heart of God. Because God's intention and blessing is not that we have. We must come to grips with that. It's not that we would have. It's that he can be demonstrated in and through us. Because his desire is not that we have, although he delights to give. His desire is that men would come to faith and know God. Right? And we are the tools through whom he does that. All right. So here we go. All right. Now he goes on to say, he gets really nasty, okay? Look what it says now. It says, verse 3 says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now verse 4 looks like it's coming in obtusely, like it's just coming in and just broadsiding you from nowhere. But what is he saying here? Look what it says. Verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know friendship with the world is hatred toward God? What is he saying here? Why does he put that right there? Well, first and foremost, when we go about our business and not ask God, what we're doing is we're actually marrying the world's way. We're going about our business by our flesh, by our strength, by the world's wisdom and the world's manner. Because we're not bringing God in. The second thing is this. The world, the world runs after everything that it can because they think they need these things. And number two, they do it for their own pleasure. He's saying, you have been transformed. You are a new creature in Christ. You now will do what I do because I, you have me in you. And now delight in not only receiving, but in giving. 
And we become adulterous toward God when we love the world and its pleasures in such a way that we don't see what it is that God's actually trying to accomplish. And we think that this is for me and not for him and you. He's given us everything. He's given me everything I need. Now, I, because I can trust that truth, I can now give away and not worry about it. And that's living in perpetual faith, faith and perpetual trust. And we, as we learn to live in perpetual generosity. And it doesn't mean we give away the house. And it doesn't mean we give to everyone we see. We need to pray for discernment. We need to pray for wisdom. Wise people do store up. They don't hoard. And they don't store up without giving. Wise people do discern who they should give to and who they can't give to. And that sometimes when you don't give, you're actually giving because you're not enabling. Understand, there's wisdom that comes with this, and we must grow in that. But the heart of it is give. The heart of it is don't hoard. The heart of it is you don't own you, let alone your stuff. You are an administrator. Listen, find joy in the distribution. Does this make sense? So, turn now to Matthew. Chapter 25. Now we're going to look at what the calibrated heart looks like when it gives. Matthew is the first gospel of the New Testament. If you're strolling backwards and you get to Luke or Mark, you need to go back one more book. If you got all the way back to Malachi, you went too far, go forward. We're in Matthew 25. We're going to look at verse 31. This is a very familiar story. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. You ready? It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him, he will sit down on his throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. Get that picture. You know, Matt wrote a song called At the Center. And it's, uh, it's, about, and, and it's his vision of what heaven's going to be like as Jesus is seated on the throne and all the nations are around him and we're all just swirling around Jesus worshiping. Well, before we have that opportunity, it says that the nations will be placed around him and he will separate us as sheep from from goats. He will judge the people. And he'll judge the people according to righteousness. And that righteousness is the expression of him in us. That's a really important point as we go forward. Watch this now. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on a throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as sheep, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, and I was a stranger, and you invited me, and I needed clothes, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you looked after me, and I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Stop. What he's saying is, sheep, you on my right, you did not strip your fields bare. But in fact, you left some for those who have not. people gleaned from you. You were generous. You reflected my heartbeat. You know what I love most about this? The calibrated heart? Watch this. Verse 36, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. Verse 37, then the righteous will answer. The righteous will answer. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes? and clothes? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. 
whatever you did for one of the least of these of my brothers of mine, you did for me. What is the mark of the calibrated heart? You don't even know you did it. You didn't even realize that that's what you had done. That your heart is beating in such rhythm with the Father's, and your character is being formed into that likeness to such a degree, and you've recognized what it is that God has given you in such a way as to allow others to glean from you, and you, didn't, you never knew it. See, the work of the believer is the child of God is to believe in the Son. And in believing in the Son, we begin to cooperate with his word because not only do we then believe the Son, we trust his commands. And when we obey his commands, his love flows through us. And as his love flows, flows through us, we begin to resemble the Father. And as we resemble the Father, our righteousness comes forward. As our righteousness comes forward, people see God. And as people see God, they want to taste and see that he's good. And he does that through us. And we don't even realize it. We don't even know. And the more time we spend with Jesus and the more we become like him, the less we realize that that's what people are doing. And it becomes a natural expression of who we are in Christ. And it all starts with recognizing I'm not an owner, I'm a steward. That there is a king who has brought me into his court and made me his child and said that everything I have is yours, now go distribute it, just like I did to you. Don't strip it bare. Trust me. Live in perpetual faith. Work hard to cultivate your fields and then let others glean from them. Amen? Amen. All right, now, here's the deal. Flip your paper over. Oh, golly, I wish we had more time. Okay, so on that paper, we got boxes. And in your hand, I hope you have a pen or a pencil. And what I would need us to do is this. I need you to write down now some of the fields that God has given you. Because most of you, again, we, I said this a couple weeks ago, we don't have orchards and vineyards and groves and fields. We don't do that because most of us in this room aren't farmers and we're not agricultural. And that's where the command was. But the principle is about God's heartbeat. So it goes on. So write it down. What fields do we have that God would say, I need you to cultivate this field regularly to allow others to glean from it? Go, write it down. Write it down. And if you have suggestions, because I last night we did this and people were really confused. They were like, I don't even know. So anyone have a suggestion? What fields do we have? Bring it. Income. Income. Excellent. Resources. Go. What else? What is that? Education. Our knowledge. What it is we have inside our heads. What else? What? Time. Our time. I heard something over here. What? Love. The expression of our affection, right? Go. What? relationships being relational and cultivating relationships what else faith our faith hopefully we're developing a faith that allows you what over here front feelings. feelings all right being able to express our feelings appropriately and know how to govern them what else what one more time a garage full of tools stuff i have what else uh, I, yeah, in fact, I'm going to let my sons glean from my tools because I'm done using them. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep one little set for myself and everything goes to my boys. What else? What? There's all kinds of stuff. How about emotional? Emotional energy. Trust. How about wisdom? What was that? Okay, now write them down. Write them down. What are these things and how are we going? Because here's the thing. Americans, guess what we're doing? There's a little thing called margins, right? What are our margins? Our margins are the place where the person comes in to taste, to see, to, to taste and see that God is good. My question to us is this. How many of us are living in our margins? How many of us are cultivating these fields in such a way as to actually have things out here on the margins that we never have to touch? Time, emotion, energy, physical strength, academia, knowledge, talents. Think about those things. Because what God is calling us to do is to cultivate these areas and cultivate them in such a way as that he can bless us and enrich us in our own eating from the field, but then have so much left that others can come in and pick from us. What is of greater value than seeing somebody who has wisdom and experience? And a little, bit of, you know, a little bit of time under their belt. As to you to be able to go to them and glean from them knowledge and experience and wisdom. 
And how disappointing it is it when you keep calling and calling and calling, but they never have the what? The time. They never have the space. They might not have the energy. And some of it certainly could be circumstantial. We all have seasons where the storms have come and wiped out our fields. I get that. But here's the problem, we in America. Too often we're living in our margins perpetually, and it's our own fault. We are living a self-induced poverty. It's one thing for us to find circumstances where I need to glean from somebody else's field. It's another thing altogether when I live my life gleaning from other people's fields. This is really big. And as believers of Jesus Christ, children of the King, he wants to bless us, but what he calls us to do is to make every effort to cultivate, cultivate these fields in such a way that others can come to us and pick from it because we haven't had to strip it bare. And this is true of every field of our lives. Now, let me encourage us. We all have fields that we do pretty well with, and then we all have fields that are laying barren over here because we've never even dug into them to you know, foot the ground, let alone plant the seeds yet. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6 really, really quick. We're going to go as fast as we can. You ready? Bear with me. So 1 Corinthians, no, 2 Corinthians 6. I lied to you. 2 Corinthians 6. I know, it's my bad. First, we're, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, in this context, we're going to redefine blessing. We're going to go all the way back to what we said at the beginning, and we're going to try to figure out what blessing is, because here's the deal. Every occasion in our life is an opportunity for blessing. Stop. Every occasion in our life is an opportunity for blessing. Not just what we get, but even when we lose. Not when we just, life is going swell, but when life is going in a difficult way. And in fact, I would counter the idea that we are most blessed when we receive, that we're actually most blessed when we've suffered loss. Because those are the places where we're formed and shaped in the likeness of Jesus in such a way as to create a character that is always gleanable. Does this make sense? Look what Paul says right here, starting at verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 3. We put no stumbling block in, in, in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. In other words, we work hard and we work with integrity. We are cultivating our field. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance. We don't quit. In hardships, in, and distresses, in beatings and imprisonments, in riots and hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity and understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor. Bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet, not re yet always rejoicing. Poor yet making many rich. Poor yet making many rich. That phrase right there is the culmination of everything that he said before that. And everything that he said before that in terms of what he had experienced, both good and bad, he saw as blessing. And the formation of Christ in him and the furtherance of the gospel as the kingdom moved forward through him and through his people despite their circumstances. And he saw every one of those opportunities, every one of those occasions as blessing the cultivation of his field, so that others might glean. Look, what it, look how he finishes the passage. Watch. Yet, so verse 9, he says, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich. Listen, look at this. Having nothing... Having nothing, yet possessing everything. See, some of us in this room have material plenty, and we think automatically to ourselves, okay, I have much, I can give much. Some of us in this room have material nothing, and it's, we're thinking to ourselves, how might we give? Paul's point was this, even though I have nothing, I possess everything, and what I possess, I will give to you. We possess the kingdom of God. We are children of a heavenly father. He blesses us in all our fields. 
he calls us to cultivate those fields and not strip them bare, but and live in such a way as we live in perpetual faith, perpetual blessing, and perpetual generosity. Letting others glean. We'll close with this. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Band, go ahead and get in place if you would. We have to see that blessing is not when we receive. Blessing is not when we have. And, 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 and what we think. Blessing is how we, per- listen, blessing is how we perceive our lives. We are not ourselves. We have been purchased by God. Blessing is how we see what we've been given. We are not owners. We are stewards. Blessing is, is the lens through which we see every occasion. How does this form me into the likeness of Christ that he would be revealed and he would be spoken of by my life? Ready? Here we go. So, chapter 9, verse 6. And this is the attitude. You ready? Remember this. Whoever sows what? Sparingly will also what? Reap sparingly. Stop. Think about your fields. How are you cultivating? Are you sowing sparingly? Then why would we be surprised that we are reaping sparingly? And why would we be then surprised that we have to strip our fields bare just to be able to live? And now we find ourselves not only in our margins, but tumbling into other people's margins. And it has nothing to do with bad circumstances. It has nothing to do with the, you know, a seasonal life. It has to do with the fact that we have not been diligent in our sowing. We've not, not been diligent in our cultivating. We've not been aware of the fields around us and what our responsibilities are in them. And then the privilege we have to cultivate them in such a way as to be able to give just as our Father has given. So look what it goes on to say. Those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. What's it what's say next? Whoever sows what? Generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What are those works? It's the opportunity for others to glean and see the kingdom of God. Look what it goes on to say. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the whom? To the poor. And his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of what? Of righteousness. That is God's expression in you through you to others. That's his being evidenced in you. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Rich in every way, generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in what? Thanksgiving to whom? To God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of what? Thanks to whom? God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God when men will do what? He'll do what? Praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession. That you not only call yourself a Christian, but you act like one. You are following Jesus, you are obeying his commands, and he is able to live through you righteously to affect others and not you be seen, but him be seen through you. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. This is the expression of the gospel when his children trust him in such a way as to obey his commands and live according to that, living in perpetual faith and perpetual trust and diligently cultivating their fields, creating a life that allows others to come in and taste and see that God is good and his righteousness goes forward and the kingdom goes forward and men praise God and thank God and pray to God. Isn't that awesome? This is what we're being called to. And as American Christians, dudes, we got to go like this. Woo! We got to learn to be stewards and not owners. 
we got to go. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to get out of here. Father, this week, may we be a people who first and foremost, we recognize we've been bought with a price. We've been purchased. We do not even own ourselves, let alone our stuff. You are the great giver of life and provider. You have been generous with us, and now you call us to be diligent in cultivating fields. Father, forgive us when we perpetually live in the margins. Forgive us when we live self-induced poverty because we're not disciplined and we're not cultivating and we're not, or we're stripping our fields bare. But thank you, Lord Jesus, in the areas that you have made us rich and we have joined you in the cultivation and people have gleaned from us. So Father, help us now to be wise in looking in our fields and wise in cultivating those things that need to be cultivated and wise in who it is we can give to and who it is we're giving by not giving. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to empathize. Give us wisdom to discern, eyes that invite, hands to give, feet to go. Stuff, Lord Jesus, not to keep, but to give. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live out the righteousness that you have given us so graciously. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. And Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. Mercy be our measure, my death is freely paid. Your love is deeper.
Jesus, your love has no bounds. Father, this week, help us to live just with a new perspective. That we are yours, purchased with a price. With the great privilege of being named administrators of your kingdom. Distributors of your stuff. So Lord, may we approach everything we are. Everything we do. Everything we receive from you is an opportunity to extend your heartbeat to allow the others to taste and see that you're good. Father, thank you that when we hit rough times, there are people we can glean from. We, we thank you from that. But I also pray, Father, we would learn to not live in perpetual poverty and self-induced poverty by not being disciplined or not doing the things we need to do to be the people you have created us to be. So, Lord God, this week, may we be a people who cultivate our fields, who allow others to glean when we need to have others in our lives from whom we can glean. Bless this week, Lord God, by making your life evident through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have an awesome week.